Hey everyone, welcome to Curious People Wanted. I'm Dr. Darren Raymond Locke, curator of the Barnum Museum here in Bridgeport, Connecticut. So I've been reading all these things, biographies, autobiographies, newspapers and letters, all about Barnum and I have so many questions. So, so many questions. But some of these questions are a little tangential in Mr. B's life but I'm still interested in the answers because I'm a massive nerd. So today I'm going to explore one of these little tangents and take you along for the ride because, well, because I can. Let's take a look at the American Museum before Mr. B bought it. According to Barnum's autobiography, the American Museum was owned by the Scudder family and it was less than a financially sound enterprise. He actually describes it as a losing concern and says that the family was anxious to sell. While the collection of the museum was estimated at being worth approximately $50,000, which today is approximately $1.9 million, Barnum managed to purchase it for just $12,000, which amounts to about $450,000 in current money. But what was this losing concern that Barnum was so anxious to buy? It all started in the 1790s when the American Museum started as part of New York's Tammany Hall. Yes, that Tammany Hall, which is pretty notorious for its corruption in the 1800s. Tammany Hall started as the Tammany Society. It was a political organization founded in 1786 and incorporated three years later. In 1791, one of the leaders of the Tammany Society, a man named John Pittard, decided that the society should have a museum which would display natural wonders. Pittard hired shoemaker Gardner Baker to act as director and together they opened the Tammany Society Museum in an upper floor in New York City Hall. At first the museum was only open to Tammany members and their families, all of whom could visit for free. But soon visitors able to afford the two shilling admission fee could visit the collections on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons. You could also buy an annual pass to the museum for a dollar. The museum rapidly expanded and within two years had to be relocated to the second floor of the Exchange Building, just one block from Battery Park. Instead of being mostly a natural history collection, the museum's holdings included relics from African and Chinese cultures, wax figures, taxidermy animals, and various curiosities like a horn supposedly taken from the head of a resident of the city. Pittard wasn't totally happy with Baker's direction. He saw the museum as a very expensive failure and decided to sever ties between the Tammany Society and the museum. In 1795, he sold the collection to Baker. But don't worry, society members could still attend for free. Baker died of yellow fever in 1798, and by 1802, a man named Edward Savage had to purchase the collection. Savage was a pretty interesting guy himself. He was a historical painter, inventor, and self-titled showman. Savage took the collection and began to display it alongside his own art gallery on Green. Savage took the collection and began to display it alongside his own art gallery on Greenwich Street. He called it the Columbian Gallery of Painting and City Museum. Realizing he couldn't run the operation on his own, he hired John Scudder, who was just 26 at the time. John Scudder was born in Braintree, Massachusetts on July 29, 1776. As a young boy, he had been apprenticed in the tobacco trade and was working as a foreman at a tobacco factory in Brooklyn when he was approached by Savage. Savage had heard that Scudder was a naturalist and a skilled, albeit amateur, taxidermist. He hired Scudder as a curator of his collection, but the young man soon was disappointed in his role. He thought that Savage wasn't really interested in making the collection a first-rate attraction, so he devised a plan. He quit. He became a sailor on merchant ships engaged in New England's coastal trade. By 1809, Scudder had saved enough money to purchase the Columbian Gallery of Painting and City Museum from Savage. The museum reopened in March 1810 as the American Museum. The museum still mostly catered to the wealthy gentlemen of society, as was par for the course at the time, and offered scientific lectures and natural history exhibits. The War of 1812 and the associated financial hardships caused Scudder to rethink the museum completely. The first major change was the location. Scudder was offered a rent-free space on the second floor of the Alms House, located in New York Institute, aka City Hall Park. 
Other institutions were already there. The New York Society Library, American Academy of Fine Arts, Board of Health, the Lyceum of Natural History, and the New York Historical Society, among others. The second big change Scudder made was the complete reimagining of the museum itself. Not dissimilar to what we at the Barnum Museum are doing today. And remember that guy I mentioned earlier, John Pittard? The one who started the original museum at Tammany Hall? Yeah, Scudder got him to help in that process too. Together, the two men displayed over 600 varieties of natural history specimens, provided lectures, entertained their visitors with both strolling musicians and Lilliputian singers named Caroline and Edward Clark. They displayed everything from Mary Queen of Scots's sheets to gruesome artifacts like guillotines used during the French Revolution. The museum was open until 9 p.m. a good chunk of the week. John Scudder died in 1821 at just 45 years old. He bequeathed his museum to his son, John Jr., who was too young to take ownership. So until he came of age, the museum was run by trustees. Okay, so here's where the story gets interesting. And honestly, couldn't make this up if I tried. John Jr. wasn't interested in the museum. He decided to go to medical school, but ended up dropping out in 1825. He then mortgaged his inheritance and set up his own competing museum called Scudder's New York Spectaculum, which was a pretty epic failure. It was only then that John Jr. finally assumed control of his father's enterprise, and by 1830, the American Museum was successful. It drew such a large and noisy crowd that the other organizations that occupied the same building complained and got Scudder evicted. On December 24th, 1830, the American Museum moved to a specially built five-story building at the corner of Broadway and Ann Street. During the 1830s, the museum grossed, on average, 7,000 per annum. However, expenses were high, and by 1841, the operation was not doing well financially. And that's where our Mr. B comes in. He bought the American Museum in 1841, but he also purchased the contents of its competitor, Peel's Museum and combined both collections into his own museum situated in the building at the corner of Broadway and Ann Streets. On a small note, and probably a sore point for Mr. B, Scudder's American Museum survived the 1835 Great Fire of New York. The Great Fire burned over 17 blocks of buildings, causing the equivalent of what would be a whopping $600 million in damage today. But it was not a grace to be repeated, unfortunately. After the Great Fire, New York installed the Croton Aqueduct water system to help combat future fires. But when another disastrous fire burned through the area in 1865, the Croton Aqueduct couldn't help save the museum. It was destroyed, but Mr. B rebuilt, only to have it burned to ashes again in 1868. He didn't bother rebuilding that time. He retired from the museum business instead. And that is the story of the American Museum before Mr. B. Thanks for joining me today for Curious People Wanted. Make sure to keep joining me as we discover Barnum together by subscribing to our channel. And remember to stay curious.